Hi, this is David Goodwin, the Assistant Director at the Fordham University Center on Religion and Culture. Thank you for joining us again for another episode of CRC Chats, our new video series that we've embarked upon uh, during our time of self-quarantine, where we're sitting down with intellectuals, authors, journalists to discuss issues of the day. Today, we're sitting down with Jim McDermott, SJ, for the third episode of our mini-series, which we're calling Binge Watching the St. Ignatius. Many thanks to Jim for joining us today. Hey, uh, great to be with you, David. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. So last week we, we chat about uh, Schitt's Creek, the hit TV series that just wrapped up. We had a lot of fun talking about it. What's, uh, what's on board for today? So today we're doing Better Call Saul. Ooh. Uh, which I can't even talk about that show without, my, without smiling. I love that show so oh, much. That, that's one of my favorites too. And then the season, the season five finale was last week. Is that correct? Yeah, it was a week ago Monday. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It was amazing. Um, so we picked, uh, or I picked, uh, so that's the season, the latest season isn't on Netflix yet, mm -hmm. but every other season is. So I picked the, the pilot or the 201, uh, season two, episode one. Right. Uh, yeah, as, as one that we could talk about. And then if, if you're interested at home, you could watch that episode again and see, you know, if what we're saying makes any sense or kind of what your own reactions are. Um, I, I picked it, if you, if you have watched the show and, but don't remember that episode, I picked it because it's the episode in which Kim and Jimmy are at a hotel and, and Jimmy gets Kim to help him pull a scam mm -hmm. on like an investment banker who's a, pretty much a jerk. They make up names for themselves. They make up uh, this idea that that they have a lot of money to invest, basically, so that they can get him to buy them this incredibly great and expensive tequila, and they they just drink it for hours and then they leave with him thinking that they've he's scored this big new account. Yeah, and, and that character is an Easter egg to um, Breaking Bad. You see him throughout Breaking Bad, um, insulting people and um, right. So it's, right, it's, he's just horrible. He's not yeah. a, he's not someone you're, you know. He, he's somebody that's always saying like go, instead <laughs> of saying like like having normal conversations. When he wants you to talk, he just says go. You know, um, so uh, so basically, like, what's our process? Basically, two steps. Right, we're gonna we're gonna go through with you right now. The first is just sort of like what feelings we had watching the episode, or what characters or moments stood out to us. Mm -hmm. We'll do that. And then second, like when it was over and we kind of sat with it, you know, what, what more happened? What did we daydream about or what, what more got stirred up in us, right? So just to start, and I'll start this time. Okay. In terms of, in terms of feelings or characters, um, I'll tell you like, so because it's the first episode of the season, the other thing to remember is it starts with a flash forward. We get to see Jimmy in the, somewhat distant future after Breaking Bad. It's black and white. He's working at that pastry shop uh, in the mall. Cinnabon, right. Yeah, and Omaha. it's so depressing. It's just so depressing, right? And I, I would say like in general for me in the episode, you know what I was feeling is I was feeling trapped. Mm. I was feeling because Jimmy, Jimmy's story at the beginning and at the end of the episode in the future and in the present is all about him being stuck in sort of a mundane, mediocre, um, to him, to, in his mind, sort of ordinary life. He, he hates it and yet he feels trapped in it. And he can't even rebel in a really interesting way. Like there's a great moment at the end of the episode where he's got this great new office, he's got everything he wanted, he hates it. And in the office, there's a light switch with, with a note on it saying, don't, don't flick the switch. And, and he does. And then he waits. It's like this little moment of rebellion. And then he, then he turns it back and puts the tape back on the light switch. Just like, God, there's so much of him that's, that's trapped. And I feel the same way about Kim, who's kind of my favorite mm -hmm. character in the show. She is. She is my favorite character. In that she feels trapped in the sense that, like, she's, she's afraid for a lot of the episode to sort of risk. The whole episode in a sense is about Jimmy getting her to, to take a risk, mm -hmm. to be spontaneous, to do something outside her comfort zone. And we're kind of watching on her face the journey from fear 
and uncertainty to like giving into it and how amazing that is. So yeah, I was feeling watching it like a lot of like being bound up and, and just wanting them to be free, you know, wanting them to have the liberation that, that he's longing for and that she needs in a way. Mm -hmm. How about you? Well, uh, well I, I was thinking a lot about the relationship between Kim and, and Jimmy. Um, we, you know, we've talked about the bar scene where they, they pulled this elaborate scam on, on the investment banker. Um, but throughout the show, you really see in many, I mean, they, the two characters have genuine affection for one, one another. Um, I think they probably generally do love one another, but they bring out, it seems like the worst elements in one another, almost if they're playing games of chicken, it seems to, uh, in this episode, again, like they're Jimmy um, at the beginning, he decides he's going to abandon the law and he's, and he's hanging around this hotel and he calls Kim to the hotel and they decide to pull a fast one on the investment banker. And as you said, they cook up this elaborate story that they just inherited, uh, you know, I think it was $1.2 million or something like that from a, a distant relative and trick right. him to buy a, a to to buy them dinner and an entire bottle of uh, tequila was, I think it was what, $100 a shot or $50 a shot. Yeah. And then he, and then later on he calls her and says, come back to the hotel. Let's do another. We have another Mark. And again, it, it it's almost as if they, they, and, she, and, and this time it doesn't happen, but we see this dynamic throughout the series where they are almost daring each other to the er edge of what is sensible um, or ethical or legal, and sometimes they go over the edge, and sometimes they go right to the edge and step back. But it's to me, I see it as almost as a, a really a, a toxic relationship in the sense if they were with someone else, they probably would not be embarking upon such high risk behaviors, and mm -hmm. they might be at different points in their lives and are more satisfied with their lives. I usually mentioned they both seem trapped in their respective points and they can't break out. Um, part of that might be who, whom, they're, whom they're paired with. Um, and I, in this dynamic, I guess, we re, we, season five just wrapped up, but we really, see episode, we really see that playing out in season five too, as well. But it's throughout the whole series. So that's, that's, that was one of the things I took away from the show. It's like, why are they doing this? Like, why? Um, and as you mentioned, he gets the job at uh, Davis and Maine, this prestigious law firm in Santa Fe. And it's, if for most attorneys, this would be a dream job. It's really cushy and he has his own car and nice office and nice colleagues and interesting work, but he just can't help himself breaking whatever rules uh, in front of him, which is the light switch. And you're wondering like, why, like, why are you doing this? And, and, and originally he turned down that job. And again, it was like, why just to um, make a statement of some sort, or just, again, it's like they're caught in this, I don't know, like pathological cycle, if that makes sense. Wow, that is, yeah. I, I, that is strong language. It's funny because I, I find, I, I don't think I think of their relationship as toxic. Uh, I, even though I know, you know, as, you know, as you watch what's going on over the, the seasons from now to the current season, definitely Kim is getting more and more involved in stuff that I don't want her involved in. Mm -hmm. And yet, I also feel like in a way she's being set free from a lot of inhibitions that I don't know, I, I don't, that don't seem helpful. Like, do I want her to be a criminal in the end? I don't think so, but I definitely don't want her to feel like she just has to fit into the boxes that she was taught at some point that she should, or that um, other people are telling her she should. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, it's weird. Even if even if she were to go to the the worst place in the last season, I I, I still don't know that I think of their relationship as toxic. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I, yeah, I mean, it's great. It's great. It just reminds me of you. You know, everyone knows or has known someone where they're they're with someone that's probably instead of bringing out the best elements, of them is is bringing out the worst. You know, it's almost like a, a negative chemical reaction, if you will. And that, that's what I see happening in their relationship is if, and it's, not if they, and it's not as if they're doing damage to one another. It's just together, bad things, I think, happen or will happen. We, ha we don't know yet, but I, I'm, I yeah, suspect. Yeah. 
they will. Well, so, and then if we took, so the other question, like kind of sitting with the episode as a whole, mm -hmm. kind of what it might, if anything, what it might kick up in us, mm -hmm. like if we're kind of daydreaming about our own lives or even about those characters, we're already doing some of that going forward. I'd say for me, and I, this is maybe a little, uh, uh, a little provocative, although, mm -hmm. you know, take it with a grain of salt. I found myself thinking afterward that I feel like in the church and, and also other institutions, there's often, those institutions often teach us from a young age to fit into certain categories. Like this is, be a good girl, be a good boy. Mm -hmm. And this is what that looks like. And, and those, uh, those rules, as, as good as they might be when we're young, I don't know, I found myself thinking, you know, when you get older, if you're still living inside those boxes, your life is very small. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I feel for Kim is like, she's brilliant no matter what, but it seems like she's afraid mm -hmm. of just like taking risks and of the unknown. And I think institutions often teach us to be afraid a little bit. Like this is what, this is the, this is the right path and every other path is kind of wrong and you know stay on the straight and narrow like it's not straight and narrow at least in my life it's mm -hmm. not straight and narrow at all it might be narrow but it's not straight mm -hmm. and if you're not taking some risks then you you're just sort of you're like you're put you're in a jail of your own making and mm -hmm. i don't know so I, I found myself thinking a lot about that and and for myself for other people just like um the need for us to be told at different points in our life, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to take risks. It's okay to take risks that are really bad sometimes. Like, you know, God, God, you know, God save us. You don't want it to be dangerous or something like that. But like, you know, if you don't explore the territory, then you don't really know what's possible for yourself, mm. for your life. And, um, and I think you do. I, I, I feel for Kim so much. I guess I, I relate to her so much because I feel like fear is a pretty, I can understand that fear, that fear of messing things up or of being seen as bad or poorly evaluated, you know, uh, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For, for me, that show is so, and it wasn't at the beginning, but that show is so much about Kim and her journey to some kind of freedom. I hope it's not, you know, that she's doomed or goes super dark, mm -hmm. but but I'm, I'm always like happy when she takes, like she takes that name in this episode, Giselle St. Clair. Like it's insane, right? It's so not Kim. But I was like, yeah, you be Giselle. You know, you give yourself that um, and see what happens, you know? Like uh, sometimes you have to make mistakes to figure out who you are. And uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. It was kicking up a lot in me like that. Mm -hmm. How about I for you? Uh, what, I'm not sure if it's an emotion, but what really st stuck with me with this episode is the absurdity uh, in the, the Jimmy, Jimmy McGill and Saul Goodman persona. I mean, we have this sequence where he's hired by uh, a really, uh, I can't, I'm not even sure the, the character's name, but who was robbed by a, a person that was involved with the character Nacho in drug dealing. Oh yeah, um, he was he was an IT worker at a pharmaceutical company, and he's he's uh, supplying Nacho with some sort of prescription drugs, and the character Nacho finds out where he lives and just robs him of whatever money he had, whatever drugs, and his baseball card collection, and and then later the lawyer <laughs> hires Saul Goodman to get him out of the situation, it, and it it just becomes this absurd uh, back and forth with the cops where he's he's manufacturing excuses for this character as why he didn't, what was in the, what was in his house that was stolen and why it was stolen. And um, I, even though it's like a dark situation, right? This person's a, a low grade drug dealer uh, yeah. or low level drug dealer, I should say, not low grade. Uh, and Jimmy McGill or Saul's just making stories up. He's lying to the police. He's, he's manufacturing evidence. It's absurd, and it, it, to me, it just shows how absurd semi-situation, serious situations might be in life, and 
sometimes that's we just have to laugh at the absurdity that might be around us. Uh, I'm not I'm not really sure that stirs up anything deep in the sense like your relation, your reaction to Kim and uh, her being boxed up. Um, I, I guess as far as more personal emotions, uh, at the beginning, Jimmy storms out of uh, the courthouse and he talks to Mike, the character played by Jonathan Banks. And he mentions, I know it was stopping me and I'll never let it stop me again. And this was mentioned, he, and this really is referring to his striving to appease his brother, Chuck. And Chuck's a successful lawyer. Jimmy, in many ways, is trying to reform himself and follow Chuck's footsteps. Um, and what that spoke to me is the idea of somehow, and I think this echoes what you're saying, living your life to satisfy someone else or make someone else happy was, is never going to work for you. Um, and and that, I think that was probably the more emotional takeaway that came up that was stirred up for me. Mm. Part, again, part one was just more of the comedy element, which really, I just, I'm always laughing at those scenes and remembering those scenes and chuckling to myself, um, which I think is a theme too throughout Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul is this, this, this blend of absurd comedy at times with really dark, stories and dark characters and dark material um sure it's funny how uh that that low-level drug dealer yeah. guy you know what jimmy and kim are doing uh and 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 the jonathan banks character too over the course of the show it's all much more serious and and and, and a lot worse in some in, in many ways than that guy and yet i care a million percent about those three characters and worry about them and want good things for them, even as they do some really awful stuff. Mm -hmm. I want good things for them. And Nacho too, please don't kill Nacho. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, like that low level drug dealer, I just have no respect for it all. You know, for me, he's kind of the garbage, like he doesn't appreciate his life or, or what he's doing. Oh, interesting. So I don't respect him either. And I think that's just a really interesting thing about the writing of the show that, they make you empathize with people that if you read about them in the newspaper, you would not empathize mm -hmm. with them. Um, they make you empathize so much that they're like family. And I'm, you know, yeah, I know what happens to Jonathan Banks, to Mike, and I'm still like hoping it doesn't, right. Right. you know? Uh, I want the last season to have the flash forward that somehow Mike's in it, you know? It's, and maybe they kill Walter White. I don't know, well, I'll, he's already <laughs> dead. Like, guess they can't do that again but well people um, speculate he never died that's you know there's some people that suggest uh, that but i i don't think so i think walter white is a more and more reprehensible character the more time has gone on like his whole shtick is oh. a lot less heroic or even you could empathize with him during breaking bad but now i don't i think the way he treats his family no. it's just the world has changed and i think he's far less he's brilliant and you have to admire him for that. But I, I don't have a lot of impulse to rewatch him treating people badly. Well, the last, I think it was the last episode of Breaking Bad. And it was his last interaction with his wife, Skylar. Uh, Skylar. Uh, he even said to her, I, and I'm paraphrasing, I did this all for, for me. Yeah. Because at the beginning of Breaking Bad, he was, he was you know, creating up these logical excuses like, oh, I'm, I'm doing this for my family. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have cancer and I want to make sure my family's taken care of. Uh, everyone should watch Breaking Bad. It's a great show. But, um, but, I, but I, agree, I agree with you. His, his character was much more pure evil where Nacho and Jonathan, I mean, and Mike and Saul, they're, they're conflicted people, like most people. Like everyone's, very few people are all good or all, all bad. I mean, we're all have some, a little bit of each in us, whether we'd like to admit it or not. I, um, true, true. Preach. So, uh, Preach. <laughs> uh, so, so Jim, this was a lot of fun and, re and really great. Um, for, for those who have watched this episode of Better Call Saul, uh, we'd love for you to share your comments uh, on, on YouTube. We'd love to hear what you thought, uh, if you agree with what we talked about, if you disagree. Um, but Jim, how, how might our audience members walk through this process watching their own favorite shows, whether it's Breaking Bad or Schitt's Creek or another, another show? Sure. So yeah, like if maybe Better Call Saul is not a show you're interested in at all, and your big show is 
I don't know this, maybe it's the 10 part Michael Jordan documentary that I keep hearing about on ESPN right now. Like, uh, very simple, right? You watch it like you normally watch a show, right? But just try to pay attention as it's going on. Like, who am I attracted to or repelled by? Basically, where are their strong feelings? And what are they? And then when it's over, it can be as simple as, you know, just take a couple minutes to just, you know, take a breath before you move on to the next episode or the next thing you're streaming or life and, uh, and just see what it kicks up in you. It, and again, it could be that you find yourself daydreaming about your own life or about the characters in the show, but just, just sort of trusting that whatever, you're, whatever it does in your imagination, that that's like a gift. You know, it could be a gift of distraction. I got a couple minutes of worrying about what's yeah. going to happen to Kim or thinking about how Jordan's going to finish the season or whatever. Um, or maybe it will be like, this character reminds me of my dad, you know? And yeah. that's, you know, just to like, we just sort of gentle with ourselves and just allow whatever comes up to come up and see if it doesn't give us something to chew on. And we'll be talking again next week. Jim, what are we going to be what TV show are we going to yeah. talk about next week? So we thought yeah. we should do something in reality TV, right? right? So um, we're still deciding between yes. Love, is, Love is Blind and The Circle, which are two kind of dating shows on Netflix, um, which both got a lot of buzz. In fact, if people have suggestions and they want us to do one or the other, maybe they can post that. Oh, perfect. Comments. Yeah. It, it, if we'll, everyone... we'll do what you want. Um, right. If people have a preference, let us know. And... Let the people vote. Let the exactly. people decide. We'll crowdsource yeah. the next episode. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, we'll be announcing on social media what, what series we decide upon or what series you, you vote upon. Uh, again, this was a lot of fun, and I'm really excited for our next uh, binge watching with St. Ignatius. Many thanks for joining us today, Jim. Yeah, it was, it was a pleasure. Great to be with you guys. And David, always a pleasure to be with you. Likewise. Stay safe and healthy.